I am thrilled to invite to this stage Matthew Jocelyn, the artistic and general director at Canadian Stage, and our esteemed guest, Robert Lepage. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Robert. 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 Portable microphone. <laughs> we have a few minutes to talk about your relationship between theater and film. And I wanted to start with a really pragmatic question. You have, one of the things that you have asserted all the time, it seems to me in your theater work, is that theater is the right to work in progress. That the first presentation of a theatrical work is a phase in its life. The second presentation may still be a phase in its life. The third presentation, likewise, that it's something that's constantly growing and that you want to constantly have the right to intervene in it. Cinema doesn't offer that same kind of liberty or that same kind of relationship between how an audience responds and how you evolve. So how do you work differently? How does that, how does that guide your approach in the work itself? Well, actually, uh, what you're saying is, is, uh, is correct, uh, I'd say up until a few years ago, in the sense that uh, we always had a sense that cinema uh, is a recorded medium, so you can't change what, what, you, what you've edited is what you get, and, and uh, uh, the audience's response, the critical response to your work will, will not change it. It will only sell it better or pan it or kill it, uh, which, of course, in the theater, you, you could always survive bad reviews. <laughs> you just have to continue getting better and, and, uh, and change city and run away on a tour somewhere, and eventually, you know, you, you, you win an Olivier Prize and you go back to Toronto and you see, see? But, uh, uh, but you can't do that with film. It's very difficult to do that with film and uh, uh, to get better. Uh, or to change it, or to to uh, uh, inject any kind of uh, you know, it's like having a dialogue, but you you says if you can't use what you're hearing from the other partner when you do film, which is kind of frustrating for somebody from the theater. But in recent years, uh, uh, the tools, uh, the 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 the, uh, the craft of theater, uh, uh, sorry, the craft of cinema has changed a lot. Uh, the, the tools allow you uh, in in the digital age uh, to change things faster, to modify things, to to. Uh, uh, and of course, the work has to allow it. It's the distribution system that doesn't allow it. I, I don't think people would want you to see my second version, my third version of Triptych. <laughs> you know, I don't think the distributors would want to distribute that. But there are ways around it. And of course, what we're going to see tonight is an attempt to that, in the sense that uh, this was a project uh, that was supposed to be three short films. And uh, as we were uh, shooting the first short film, we said, why, why don't we do a second one? And when we were shooting the second one, we said, why don't we do a feature? So actually, we were working on, th on four projects, three short films and uh, a full feature. And uh, so we got, a, we got a chance to revisit the same material, but in different ways. So of course, if you see this story uh, in, in its full-blown uh, full version, which is uh, the, the, the feature, and then you see the three uh, half hours. Uh, they're edited completely differently. They're, 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 it's the same story, but it, it's 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 told and it's approached in a different way with a different vocabulary. So it's an attempt to try to do that kind of work in progressy thing and to 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 invite that into the cinema. And that's all from the same recorded material. That is, you haven't re-invited the actors to go and f shoot scenes again. It's, uh, it's we from did, the same. We did uh, not not a lot, not as much, of course, as I would have liked it but yes we we did do that at times and we we did um, once the uh, we had this deal this distribution deal where we weren't allowed to show any of the short films uh, before the the feature was uh, was shown in festivals and then and, and and then distributed and after that we were allowed to show the so we we could react to to how, what people understood and did not understood or, or understand or or what what they what they preferred, what they saw, which what they projected in the film. So we did kind of, uh, because we did the editing and the, and the mixing after that of the short films. That actually, that brings up something that I had not at all thought about asking you about, but when you say the distrib you had a deal with the distributors saying you could not show the short films until the, er until the earlier ones, another element that enters into the difference between fabricating theater and fabricating cinema is the relationship with the producer or the distributor. Like so, how can, because you're more or less in control of your theater work at all stages of it. You don't have to bow down to the rules of. How does that, how does that affect you? 
Well, of course, in theater, I mean, you're, you're a theater presenter, so you know that, for example, this year you've presented Needles in Opium. It's a very early version of it, and it's the first English, uh, it's, it's actually the, 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 the world pr English premiere yeah. uh, version. Yeah. But we're coming back. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to sell tickets here. Help me out. No, but we're coming back next we'll come year. Back. Let's just talk about and, that. <laughs> but, no, no, but, but, but in the meantime, what happened with, with the play is that it toured Australia, it toured New Zealand, it's gonna play in Montreal in French again for quite a while, and then it's gonna go somewhere else, I don't remember where, anyways. So by the time it comes back to Toronto, it will have gone back to French, back to English, back to French, and that process rewrites it, makes it better, makes it more informed, uh, uh, is of course, you know, this audience and reviewers or whatever that, that give comments, and, and what are those comments worth if you can't uh, if you can't take them in and digest them and actually inject them in it. So, so in film, uh, that's the thing that's difficult, is that if you don't play around with the distribution system, you can't do that. And I think that now with what happens on the web, there's a lot of people whose material are seen first on, on the web and then eventually get a distributor uh, to do it, but they get a chance to get a hack at it, to get another hack at it and, you know, so, um, and it's tricky, and, and you don't, you're not, uh, a presenter in theater and a distributor are not the same things, though they do the same job, which is to That's present it to, to, to the audience, but uh, the distributor, um, it comes, it's, it's a set of rules that really kind of uh, uh, paralyzes the work. Of course, they're doing their best to try to promote the work, they're trying to make money off of it, and I understand all of the rules of that. It's a different system, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very stifling. Right, it's a more constraining one. Just want to, without belaboring this point of the, the difference structurally, but Needles and Opium is an excellent example in that it's also a piece that you did 20 years ago. And that 20 years later, you decided to revisit, amongst other reasons, because of Marc Labrèche, who, who was the principal actor in this play, and when you talked to him about another project, he said, let's, let's revisit Needles and Opium. That was an extraordinary opportunity, not just to tweak and fine tune a piece, but to revision it entirely. And to rewrite it. And to rewrite it entirely. Rewrite it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, what, what, you, uh, what you think of love and existentialism and whatever the play was about when you're 27 and when you're 56, it's, you know, there's a, whole, <laughs> there's a whole life that went on in the meantime, and why not rewrite, revisit, uh, digest it in a way, you're more mature, you, I don't know, why not? I know, absolutely. Can you imagine doing that with any of your films? Do you want to go back to the Confessionnale or do you want to go back to Possible I just, Worlds? I'm just not allowed to go back to the Confessionnale, but I, I've shot a completely different film that people are going to see tomorrow evening. And I'd like to go back to that material and, and I'd like to do something different. And I, and I hope that, as I said earlier, the, the, the new tools will allow that to revisit to it. Right now, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of remastering of films, and of course, and what it does is that it, in, it reinserts some scenes that have been cut, and it, the sound is better, uh, and the image is probably better, but the, the, a, a, a fundamental shuffle of scenes and a fundamental rewriting uh, is rarely seen, and, and I'd, be, I'd be curious to see what happens with material you've shot 20-some years ago, and now you, you tell the same story, but maybe in a more informed way or in a more mature way. Or yeah, it seems that if anybody could do that, you're the person, uh, and it would be lovely to it would be lovely to, to to experience that. In going on with this notion of the relationship to time, now not in the fabrication of the work, but inside the work itself. In a lot of your theater work, you are dialoguing between a present narrator or character yourself or somebody who's a an incarnation of yourself uh, and something that's happened in the past you're balancing back and forth and creating a dialogue in the cinema you're doing in those films that I've seen somewhat the same thing but the the, the return to the past is often um, more psychological it's more looking at the characters when they were kids uh, that you have, for example, in in uh, in the Le Confessionnal, or that you have in uh, La Face Cachée de la Lune, the, the hidden face of the, the moon, so that we are getting a perspective on the childhood of the characters, and then seeing them in adult life. Is there is there some is is that a choice to deal with past present in a different way on stage than in cinema? And what do, what does the theater offer in terms of that dialogue, and what does the cinema offer in terms of that dialogue? Well, often when I, I, I do that and on, on stage, uh, what I like is to try to draw parallels between uh, 
what happened at, at this time and what happened that time is often the characters are not related, but the uh, the themes are related or uh, the energy is the same or whatever. And I, and I like doing these kind of strange historical coincidences. I like to play with that. On film, um, you have to accept that the camera, you know, uh, the camera gets closer to the actor and, and, and actually is much more indecent in a certain way, wants to know more about the character. So, so if you are going to do go back into the past, you, you probably want to go back into the past of the character and try to, like, there's a bit of that in the film that we see tonight. There are some sequences of the past and, uh, and that's of course very, uh, it's not very original, but it's, but it's a very important, I think, to, uh, uh, and, and I've, I've learned with time, uh, you know, I'm much more of a, a stage person. I'm not a, a real film person. And uh, for me, film is more of a hobby. So sorry, the people in the room who serve <laughs> your real your real job. You're trying to. Do. I'm not stealing any of your subsidies. I've paid half of this with my my own money. So and Telefilm didn't put a, a cent in it. So I don't feel that embarrassed about it. But still, it's a hobby, and uh, and I learn a lot. I, get, I think I'm a better stage director because I do film, and uh, I've learned by doing film. You know how um, it, you, you it has to be less wordy. It's a very visual medium, so you have to let image speak. Uh, you have to let the actors speak in a different manner. You don't need to always be using words. Uh, what you're going to see tonight was very wordy when it was on stage. And I've worked with a wonderful co-director who, who taught me to shut up <laughs> or to speak less or, or to or less is, is less is more and, and so but it takes a while. You have to do a few a few of these films to Otherwise, you do film theater, and which is not really, really interesting. And another thing that I've learned in the process of doing filmmaking is that uh, we have this kind of strange notion that you could take a good play and you say, I really want this to become a film. And what you do is that you transfer it into film. But it, there's nothing more different than film and theater. It's the, 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 they, they, they look the same. You know, there's characters, there's situations, there's sets, there's storylines, there's dialogue. Yes, they all have that in common. But it's a completely radically different world. It's not. It doesn't operate the same way. So, with time, I, I learned that um, by the time I was doing Far Side of the Moon, I understood that uh, uh, novel writing uh, is much closer to film than theater is to film. So I started to try to imagine. Well, what if my play was a novel? And then say, what what would I need to say? What won't I need to say? What advantage would I have if it was a novel instead of being... So I wouldn't need this dialogue. I would describe this this way or I would do this. So when you start thinking of your play as a novel, you're much closer, you're getting much closer to film. And that's what I would time that I, I kind of learned to do. And this, this is probably a good example of this. Uh, it's, it was really, really kind of uh, filtered through this kind of novel writing. Right, that's sure. interesting. When you, when you said earlier you think you're a better stage director because you do film, can you elaborate? Well, yeah, because um, uh, when when uh, when theater is boring, it is boring. It is the worst thing in the world. It is worse than bad than a bad movie, right? There's nothing worse than a bad play. There is no place in the world where you feel like a like an like a, a prisoner like a hostage yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i always feel I like agree. a hostage i go see my friends shows and i go oh no yeah, oh no you know then of course i go see their movie and if the movie's bad you kind of go okay and then eventually you kind of whiz off you and get it popcorn at the anything. same time i'm sorry you get popcorn at the same time so it's popcorn, okay yeah no no but i mean it, that, that's the thing is that it, it's it's a um, theater is a sport and if 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 it's a lousy game that night it's horrible i mean it's the worst thing in the world bad theater and uh, well, why, why was okay? Yeah, because yeah, you were asking to why about, does why does having yeah, made cinema so, made you a better director? One of the reasons why audiences, I'd say, with time that the theaters are getting empty more and more, is because there's something. Um, I think people still love theater. They still like the sport of theater. They still like the the, the fact that it's live and that they can relate uh, to an event, a live event, and, and that I think that still is there. But but if the vocabulary is a vocabulary from the Middle Ages, and, 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 and they're stimulated by all this new vocabulary, the vocabulary of film, of course, of television, of the web, of video, rock video clips, whatever. The, 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 um, the storytelling vocabulary has evolved so quickly, and people are so quick now, and they're at the end of the story before you are. 
And there you are on stage performing your story, and you know they're all at the end of the play, and you're, we're still doing, we're in act two, scene one. You know, and of course it's boring. So that's what I, that's what I'm, I think that, I'm not saying that we have to take film and bring it on stage. I'm not saying that, but I think we have to learn from where film's going, where the, where, where, um, uh, where, where TV's going, uh, where a soap opera's going, where whatever, whatever kind of storytelling with actors, where uh, uh, even uh, TV reality shows. You know, to, you have to you have to be curious. And you have to understand what people relate to, what what storytelling device is there and how people's mind is, are, are, are so quick. And I think that in the theater, um, and at times in film, um, people don't think that the audience is an, are intelligent. They don't think that, they think, oh, the audience will, they're gullible, they'll, you know, they don't know about this. But no, on the contrary, maybe the audience sometimes is not educated, maybe the, the audience doesn't have a culture, but it has uh, this vocabulary, it, it knows about storytelling. With time, I'm not sure that if you if if we went back in time in the '60s and we'd show a, a much music uh, Canadian rock band rock video to them, they'd go, "Oh, well, what is this?" You know, they wouldn't understand. But with time, you get used to, and commercials or whatever. So I think that you have to be sensitive to that. Try to understand how the audience's mind works, and how how they perceive and what a story is, and, and so audiences are very quick now. And, and uh, uh, I'm not saying that we have to go faster, I'm just saying there's a reason why they're quicker and you have to understand how that works. And I think by doing film, by being interested in other uh, storytelling uh, art forms, uh, you, you become a better theater person. So that's, that's, that's uh, it's fascinating and where cinema helps you in your perception of how to work in the theater. What, what can you do in the theater that you can't do on a screen. Well, I think it's there's a there's a thing you can do in the theater. I don't think you um, th this uh, it's a difficult. It's a, in, in French, we say um, uh, le temps se dilate, which when you translate literally really sounds bad. Uh, time, <laughs> but time expands. Time dilates. Time, dilates, like, yeah, time well, expands. Yeah. But yeah. it's not just expands; it dilates itself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it it uh, time is irrelevant in the theater, and I don't think in film. Yes, in film you could you could you know uh, three hours goes by and you go yeah of course you could do that but it's not the same experience. There's something about what goes on in, in the there's a communion that mm -hmm. goes on in the theater that you don't have with film. Communion means that uh, like we're, we're having tonight we're having a conversation you, we're, we're the ones with the with the content but there's people listening to us and we feel if they're interested or not if they're awake or not they if they understand if they so so there is a kind of a a thing going on here, right? You know, yeah, there's yeah. no real fourth wall. There's, so, and that th th theater uh, uh, surfs on that. If you're a good theater artist, yeah. you, you surf on that. And okay, tonight it's this way. Oh, there's less people tonight. Oh, everybody. And that, and and in a way, um, when I was um, I worked on a Cirque du Soleil show in Vegas called Ka, and it was a big two hundred fourteen million dollar extravaganza. Right. <laughs> And, uh, and this was done with eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. And, uh, anyways, but what was interesting in the experience in Vegas is that uh, with Cirque du Soleil, when they do the big shows in Vegas, you get eighty previews. Okay, and eighty previews. It's easy to have eighty previews because it's uh, eight weeks uh, multiplied by ten performances a week. Right, that's what they do. So you get uh, eighty previews before you open officially. But the room is filled. There's two thousand five hundred people, and it's easy in Vegas. There's so many conventions and there's so many. So one night you sit there and they're all nuns from Denver. <laughs> and they're all reacting to your show. And you go, okay, that's interesting. And then after that, everybody's Japanese. And they all have a, hi, my name is Mr. Matsumoto and all that. And they all look the same. You go, okay. And they react in a certain way. And then everybody has a cowboy hat at the seven o'clock show. And then the, the, there's the porn star convention, you know, there's a perfect, <laughs> and then you see like silicone and you see this forever. And they're all reacting. And you get 80 chances, and I just, it was so fascinating. I was looking at that, and you go, okay, you get a sense. This is not the same show. They're not watching the same show. And the performances, of course, in circus, is, it's not as, uh, because things are so programmed and rehearsed and all of that. It's not like a, a real theater piece, but you don't get the same kind of uh, dialogue, let's say, that if it was a play. But, uh, and I was imagining, can you imagine if we did a play and we had 80 
uh, 80 previews with radically different people from all walks of life, people who understand the language, people who don't, tourists, uh, young people, old people. And you get a chance you know, to see, okay, this is how, and your show is, it becomes like a three-dimensional diamond that you, you kind of shine in these different facets and, and you see that it's, it's, uh, it's more sculptural than film. Though in a way, in, in the fact that you do assert this right that theater is always a work in progress and the right to return to it, you do have 80 previews. You sometimes have 120 previews because every show in a way yeah, is a preview. Yeah. yeah, in a certain way. But the thing is that it, it, it's a question of, of, of um, it's a writing process. Yeah. You know, it's really a writing process. Um, the inverse, the relationship between theater and cinema, is there any way in which being a theater director, it's obviously impacted your work as a cinema director, has it made you a better cinema director? Uh, well, yes, it made me accept uh, a few things. It made, uh, well, I'd say the main thing is that the reason why I'm co-directing this film, the, re the reason why I co-directed this film and I felt so comfortable and I think I should, if ever I do another movie, I should co-direct, um, that comes from my, my experience in the opera. And... Uh, you know, there's, there's an ego thing that goes on in the film in the film industry where, you know, you're the director, and, you know, uh, there's this whole thing, and it's, it's my movie. And, and I don't know, I've never really felt comfortable with that because I come from a more collective kind of gang. We improv, and we, we write it all together, and even if I, I sign the mise-en-scene, this, this, it's, it's a collective effort. So I always felt a bit kind of uncomfortable when I went into the, the film world because it's, it's difficult to be collective. And uh, when it worked in the opera world, I went, oh, this is interesting because there's two bosses. There's the conductor that has as much power as I do. Sometimes more power, if, you know. Yep. <laughs> so you're working yep. with James Levine, he has, more, he has more power than you do. But anyways, and, but you know, you, you, you share the, the, the stage with, with somebody who, who the, the, art, the, the singer, the soprano, is going to listen as much to him as she is to you. So how do we work together? How my indications don't contradict what he's saying. So you have to learn to work with a, another person who's, who's completely obsessed by another thing than you are. Right. And then you understand that your work is, uh, I'm about space and he's about time, right? So if, I don't, if, I, if I'm not a nuisance to his idea of time and if he's not a nuisance to my idea of space, we'll get along together. And then you, you direct the, the, the singer uh, in the same direction giving a, a, a indications, a complementaire, compl complementary. Thank you, I can't yeah. pronounce that in English for some reason. And uh, so, so, so the, the artist doesn't feel uh, confused. He yeah. doesn't feel in a sandwich between two directors. He kind of, and um, so when I decided to do this thing, I was a great admirer of the work of Pedro Pires, who I'd, I'd, heard, I'd helped before on a, uh, one of his short films, uh, Dance of Death, uh, uh, Dance Macabre, and uh, anyways, it's a long story, I won't go into that, but, but just to say that I, was, I really wanted to work with him, and, and, and I, he was desperate to uh, direct his first feature, and I said, well, why don't you direct it with me? And he found that curious, that another director would want to right. share the, the... But I said, no, on the contrary, I'm sure there's a way, and, 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 we, and I tried to find that same kind of balance as when I work in an opera piece, that he 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 writes with his camera he's a, he comes he's really a film guy and he comes from that world and he would bring it to a place where i don't think i could have brought it and then i reinforce because i maybe i'm stronger on the dramaturgical aspect of things directing the actors and all that so so it was i was finding a a, a delicate balance of and i think that that's a direct um a thing that i imported from my my experience in, hmm. in in the opera. We're being given the signal to stop. Okay. Um, any final words about Triptych that you'd like to share or things to be particularly attentive to? Uh, just one thing. I know a lot, a lot of people wrote stuff about Triptych and they keep saying that it's a nine hour show that was squeezed into an hour and a half. It's not the case. It's only three parts of the nine hour thing. It's only three that were uh, squeezed into the hour and a half that you're going to see. So this is like one third of, of, of lip sync. It's not the whole thing. So, um, but it is its own thing. It's, it's, it's its own story and it has a beginning, a middle and an end. But uh, for some reason, people think that we've, we took that ex we've adapted nine hours into an hour and a half and it's not the case. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure. Thank you all. Enjoy the screening. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Have a good evening.